Welcome to Book Tabu TV. I'm John Purcell and I'm here with Garth Nix, author of the Old Kingdom series, with a prequel to that series called Clarion. Welcome, Garth. Hi, John. It's good to be here. Why have, you, why have you done this? Why have you returned to the Old Kingdom? I actually had the idea for the story a long time ago. I was, in fact, while I was writing Lirael, the second book, uh, which was in the late 90s. In fact, I went back to my manuscript books the other day to find out exactly when I made a note about one of the characters. And that character in Lirael is an ancient necromancer called Claw of the Mask. And at the time, I made a little marginal note that said, how do you get to be an ancient evil necromancer? I mean, where, where do ancient evil necromancers come from? I mean, presumably, they were, you know, they were human. They were somebody relatively normal at some stage. And I thought I'd like to write that book. I'd like to write the origin story of an ancient evil character. And Clariel is, is pretty much the result of that. It was an idea I had a long time ago. I carried it in my mind and I made notes here and there. And then probably four or five years ago, I decided I was going to write that. I was going to go into the schedule as the, as the next book that I write. So I wrote a lot of, I've written a lot of books in between, but it was always lurking in the back of my mind that I would come back to the Old Kingdom and, uh, and, and write this book, and in fact also write another book set in the Old Kingdom. So I, I think I needed to go away for a while, mm -hmm. but I, I, I always wanted to come back. It's, it's a very rich world, there's a lot of stories there. Uh, so I always wanted to come back to it, it was just finding the right, the right time to do so. How do you manage that? I mean, have you got, have you got notebooks which have like an idea for a prequel written on the front of it and whenever you come up with something you just drop it, drop it in like a, to try and corral I have, I have a whole, I have a whole series of notebooks which I have to flick through thinking I know I wrote something about this <laughs> which, which book was it in where did I write it and eventually I, I will find it I do try and keep them sort of organised I have manuscript books for particular books because I used to write most of my books longhand first mm -hmm. so I have complete sets of manuscript books for nearly all, all the earlier books like Sabre, Illyrio, and Porson, Shades Children uh, and so on, Mr. Monday, and so on, from the Keys to the Kingdom. So, and I love those because I can look at them and say, there is the manuscript in those six or seven or, or ten hardbound black and red notebooks. And I, I, I really I love looking at those. But I, I stopped doing that probably about ten years ago. I kept using the black and red notebooks, but they wouldn't be complete manuscript books. They'd be ideas, they would be parts of the books because I still write some parts longhand. I'll write a chapter or uh, something I'm having difficulty with, I often write longhand first because that seems to work better for me. But I mostly just write it straight out these days. So you, when I do need to find a particular note about a future book, sometimes it's going back through 10 or 12 or 15 notebooks, where is that note? And, and I will find it. And of course the other thing I had to do with Clariel is reread my earlier books as well. Yeah. Uh, because i just forgotten a, a lot of the stuff that I... I I'd, I'd written about, I'd forgotten stuff that I'd set up. Sometimes subconsciously I'd set it up without knowing I was doing so. It's one of the great things about writing, I think, is that you, quite often you were setting up things for other stories without really being aware of it. So yeah, I had to go back and reread, reread the earlier books and, and the short stories that were set in this world and, and look back through a lot of notebooks and keep doing it constantly, all the while, all through the process. So you've, you've sold over five million books and a, 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 lot, of, um, a lot of those were the, the Old Kingdom series. Um, so you've got a great deal of readers who have read the three, but there are people coming to it now who have not read any of them. Do they start with Sabriel or do they start with, with Clarion? You could start with either one. I, I think both are ways into the Old Kingdom, both are ways into the big story of that world, and either one would work. So I think you could, you could come into it yeah, um, through, through Clariel, through the prequel, or through Sabriel. Uh, you could probably even start with Lyriel, uh, but best not to start with a Porson because that's like the second half yeah. of Lyriel. It would be quite puzzling, I think. And I certainly know people who, who have started in the past with Lyriel and then gone backwards and so on. So I, I think the stories are standalone enough in themselves that you, you, you could start with, with either, either of them. But if you've read the other books, you'll certainly get more from Clariel. When you're going back, um, and you read through your, your books, especially having written in 1995. Well, written even earlier. Yeah, course, you written earlier, yes, earlier, in the yeah. early 90s. So yeah. how long, so that was about three or four years to... Uh, well, again, I could, I could go back to my manuscript book and I could look at where I keep a track of the word count and the date for each chapter. So I can, I can go back and look at Sabriel and say exactly when I wrote it. Um, 
you should have brought it with me. Um, <laughs> it would be great. Would have been helpful. Yeah. Uh, it was written basically between ninety two and the beginning of nineteen ninety four, maybe the end of ninety three. And do you see do you see changes? I mean, you've been writing for so long since then, um, and and writers taking all this extra information. Uh, you've got the full story to work with. What, do you, did, when you've been writing a prequel to a, a, a well-established series, do you have to, to be like Garth, old Garth, or do you write like a new Garth? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I, think you, I think there has to be a consistency of, of style. Uh, but I think I sort of naturally have that anyway. I didn't have to try very hard, I think, to, to fit back into, into the, the style of storytelling and writing for those books, because it's not the same as for my children's books, for example, or for some of the other things I've written. But these are all sort of craft aspects. And I think if you've been writing for a long time, as I have, and you've written a lot of stuff, then you naturally you fall back into what you need to do for that particular book. I guess it's like being a carpenter and you've been making tables for years and all of a sudden you've got to start making chairs again. But you used to make chairs, so you know how to do it. It all comes back. It's in, it's in your mind and, and, and your hands. Um, also, being a prequel set 600 years earlier, while it's in that same world, it, it is 600 years earlier, there are differences, so there is freedom to, to do stuff. Uh, you're not totally constrained by the other books. Sometimes, if, if it had been a prequel set immediately before Sabriel, I think that would have been much harder because it would have to tie in so much more closely with the, with the events in that book, whereas being a prequel, there's lots of things it needs to, to, to tie in with. There's lots of things that were established to do with the Old Kingdom, to do with magic, with charter magic and free magic and, and so on, and the whole myth and legend of that world, but it uh, doesn't have to connect in with so many story elements, I guess, because it is 600 years earlier. Now, I want to ask you a question about Game of Thrones, because the success of Game of Thrones has just been monumental. I mean, all over the place with... with um, on, in, in every part of merchandising you come up with, they've got something to, to sell yeah, about Game yeah. of Thrones, and more and more people are into it. Is the success of Game of Thrones good or bad for Garth Nix? Is, is, it, is it something that, that you're, you're going, yes, finally? Um, I, to be honest, I, I haven't thought about it in those terms. I think it's good. I mean, I, I like the books. Um, I've, known, I've known George for a long time. Um, uh, I've actually just had a, had a couple of stories and anthologies that, that he's done with, with Garda Dozois including Rogues, I don't know, if I presume you guys have it, a big fantasy yeah, anthology, yeah. I've got a story in that, so um, uh, so I'm, I'm very happy that, that, that George likes my stories um, as well. Um, I, like the, I like the books, I like the television series. Because it's become, cause the reason is, because fantasy has become mainstream, everyone seems yeah, to, grandmothers to, to kids are even, even are watching this It's thing. an interesting question because certainly the advent of Harry Potter changed things a lot for me because they, it made the whole realm of children's and young adult fantasy much more attractive to publishers and booksellers and the media. Yeah. And I was already working in that space. So, and I've described this before, I was like paddling my little canoe and then this huge tidal wave came past and it picked me up as well. It, it carried me along as well. I think uh, Game of Thrones probably has also done that for fantasy in general, mm. moving it more into the mainstream, making it more acceptable, more interesting. Um, so I think it probably is good for Garth Nix. Yep. It's probably good for f fantasy in general. Um, but there's often a downside to that sort of thing as well in that you sometimes get a rushing around of, of, uh, of publishers and other media trying to replicate those successes and doing it in a, in a, in a sort of rushed and, and hasty way where they are trying to actually, you know, totally replicate that success as in copy it. Yeah, and that's that's often results in terrible. Awful, there's some pretty awful dodgy things. covers coming out. I mean, there's some histories that are coming out that have the Game of Thrones cover. Yeah, like which, they're, just, they're just trying to. Which is foolish, yeah. in my view, because you you're you're trying to sell the wrong thing, and people who are attracted to the cover will look at it and think, oh, it's like Game of Thrones. Oh no, it's actually uh, a biography of Edward the Third. Yeah, I'm not interested in it. So the cover, it's like the Venus flytrap thing. It attracts the insect who then gets killed. I mean, you're attracting a reader who then won't, who won't, who won't want it. Yeah. Um, but I think, I think in general, um, it, it, it's positive. Game of Thrones is very, is, is very positive for the industry as a whole. Uh, but the downside is, is all that, all that, that sort of copier stuff. But also, I suppose the other thing is that um, sometimes people draw conclusions that mean that only that type of fantasy will work. 
Yeah. So you'll get film and television and book publishers thinking, well, everything has to be like Game of Thrones, and that that's a negative. Well, I'm not sure. I'm not sure we're really seeing that. Maybe we will. Thank you very much for joining us. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you. All of Garth Nick's books are available from Booktopia.com.au right now.